Well, we're recording. Hello, world. Oh, <laughs> uh, it's Christina again. I'm here today with the lovely Kat Castro, uh, who's a cinematographer in the New York City and Boston area. And uh, we're going to talk about all the great things like we have already on this program, if you will. Um, I'll let to start it off with um, Kat, if you wouldn't mind telling the folks back home how you started in this business, what maybe was your first gig in the industry or how you even got to the industry in the first place and then how that got sure. your cameras? I guess it depends on what you consider a set. Like I did a short and then like, but then there's like the first time I was like on a union show. So it's a little bit roundabout. I come from photography. So like I would take pictures of sets of like little shorts and stuff on the weekend and stuff like that. So it was the first time on set. And then um, those people would go on to like, make kind of strides in the local Boston film industry and would go PA and stuff like that. And one time a friend said, oh, you want to interview for this movie that it needs a PA? And it was um, Night and Day, the one with Tom Cruise and Cameron Diaz back in 2009, seven or something, long time ago. And um, I interviewed and I got it. And by that time I was still doing a lot of photography. So that was like kind of my main gig. But then I did this PA job and I was like, oh, this is cool. And it was not on set. It was in the art department. So I was in art department for a while. So I was in the office, which I really, really liked because I have a background in architecture. So I thought that like art direction was kind of like made sense for me. Um, so I did. I really did. And I love art department. Art department is a great, great department. Um, then after that show i did end up on set set as like a set pa realized quickly that ad department was not for me <laughs> but going on set i realized that camera was like seeing the camera guys was definitely and guys by guys i mean guys they were always guys um but i thought they were really cool <laughs> and so i always kind of tried to you know make friends with the camera people and kind of started talking to them uh, ended up back in the art department on a bigger movie called RIPD. And it was a very big movie, like $250 million temple movie. You never heard of it. No one ever saw it. It was such a, a tank. But uh, it was really, really big and really, really fun. And I started in the art department on that. I was hired. But then they knew I was a photographer. And what happened was that the DP needed a photo assistant for the hair and makeup shoot. And they recommended me because they didn't want to like look anywhere else. They're like, you're, you, your photo, you go be the assistant. So I met Alwyn Kutcher, uh, BSC, who's an amazing uh, DP, like Hannah and Sunshine and awesome stuff. And he was really, really cool. And he's like, if, if you want to be in camera, why don't you come to camera? And I was like, get me in camera. So he walked to the UPM and he's like, this is, she's going to be my assistant. And I was his assistant for that movie which got me in the camera department. Um, I was, I don't know. What goes on the record and off the record? Because <laughs> if this goes, I mean, it's already, are you going to edit this? <laughs> <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> okay. Well, I was essentially the camera PA. Oh, I was the camera okay. PA, which is not a position that exists. Opinion, but I was the camera PA on that more than just an assistant I was camera PA which yeah and it was a really long movie it was like six months so I got oh, my, wow. my ass handed to me and that was that was my film school that was my intensive camera film school it was right when um the first Alexa came out the first digital that was like the first real viable digital camera that people were using when the first Alexa classic came out so I was right there when I was learning digital with these like seasoned ACs, 20, 30 year ACs that had to sit down and learn this new camera. I was there with them. So essentially I was just like the perfect place to learn everything from scratch. Um, and just everything was a new workflow. Everything had to get figured out. And I, w I was in it. I was in there learning everything to the point where I knew how to build those cameras. And I knew how, all the you know cables and all the things and troubleshooting and all this stuff I learned really, really well. So by the end of it, um, it was such a big show because it was in Boston that they had like main unit with four cameras going, second unit, special effects unit, visual effects unit, stunts unit. They had about maybe 
eight to 10 camera crews going, that they ran out of assistance, that they needed more people. And by that time I had already been like, so what do I have to do to get in camera? And I had already kind of laid the groundwork. I had been on yeah. phone talking to the union, talking about how to get in, um, that they, I got walked in. And at, by the end of the movie, I was local 600. I was digital util utility, um, working with the DIT. The DIT had his own truck. That's how big. <laughs> there was a camera truck and there was a DIT truck. That's nuts. And anybody in camera department understands that that's nuts. That's crazy. Um, but yeah, because there was also film on the job. Wow. I know. It was a crazy, crazy job. So there was a little bit of loading. There was all this digital. There were like four, four or five uh, Alexa cam classics on. That's why the DIT had his own truck for just downloading LTO, doing all this shit. It was Oof. crazy. It was it was a big job. So I ended up being like eligible to to work on it, and they they just like everybody vouched for me because I was I really really did the due diligence to learn the ins and outs of everything. So they felt that um, we need someone. She's we trained her. She's ready. And I was in the union. I was in local 600, which was amazing. That was a very, that's your first question. And it just took me like 15 minutes to answer. I'm so sorry. But that was like. <laughs> no, it's great. I feel like it's really important. And I tried important. to do as fast as I could. <laughs> no, I think that's what's really uh, exciting, at least for myself. And I'm, I imagine for other people is that mm -hmm. I think there's this kind of like bubble of like yeah. the entertainment business and people that aren't in it. And you're like, how do you get there? And then yeah. like every person I've interviewed has these really varied stories. Some people did yeah. go to film school. Some people just knew, knew someone that knew someone that got yeah. them on set, you know, and, and even like the very first jobs, you know, I think it's like any, anyone that's getting out of college or any type of school, it's still, it's still a lot of learning, you know, yeah. and those first experiences can be completely overwhelming, but in like the best positive way, you know, cause and, you're like, yeah, just learning how to swim. Yes. And an antidote to uh, a, a, a note about that. On my first job, when I got the job, the day that I got the job on night and day, I remember going up in the elevator with the art director and he's like, you're in. And like, I didn't know what that meant, but he's like, you're in. Like, that was my first job that led to the next job that led to the next job. It's like, that was me breaking into that bubble. And um, I got, I did well in the interview. I was like super enthusiastic and energetic and I um, work really hard for you and um, I probably was like super bubbly and I got the job and that was my in into like everything that led from there uh, so so you know he said that in passing but you know after years of, I'm like oh my god he's right like that was the moment that switched everything for me um because I just didn't look back after that and which was crazy and exciting and awesome and you know I still take some pictures but I'm not <laughs> not a photographer you know like that was definitely something I realized that the team and the, and the world and the family that's built on set is like none other and you're just like I think you had it really well it's just in the email you sent you're like what did you say I'm gonna look it up because oh. I did it perfectly <laughs> I'm like yes I have to look it up what did you write it's like I say a lot of things and I write a lot of things, but I don't know about the community. It's this great. Yeah. Community. It's just the sense of freaking purpose, the sense of purpose that it gives yeah. you and, and that community that you feel is, is there, is really there the second you step on set. And it is pretty amazing. I have and to say for, can. for anyone that, I mean, I feel like people can experience this in different industries. I can't mm -hmm. say from experience, but specifically in this one, I think with something like a camera, the best way that I've been able to maybe explain it to someone who doesn't know cameras is thinking of it like an engine. And if we, or even, I know there's so many metaphors you could use, but say we'll stick mm -hmm. with engine. Um, and it's not just one person working on the engine, it's six people working on the same engine. So if, you're, mm -hmm. if your team is in sync, and you're like all passing the wrenches and passing the right tools and someone say like scalpel go wrench go. yeah like that feeling of when you're all connected and then the engine's like running and purring nice it's like such a remarkable feeling it is on top of then knowing that this vehicle as the camera and the lens and the film and all the stuff is then telling a story 
Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that's something that I definitely want to discuss with you more is that sense of how camera persons are this vehicle for a director's story. And you, and as much as I would like to think of the cameras or camera people, it's almost separate. Um, I don't think you can like separate cinematography from the story. It's so much the, yeah. the inner play. So yeah. I don't know, can you maybe talk about your experience working with directors and how you're working with telling their story, whether it's a narrative or non-narrative work? Yeah, I mean, and I think something that assisting definitely taught me, and I don't know, maybe just more than assisting more, I probably can dig into more of my history and think about things that make me think of things in that certain way. It's just like putting yourself in something, but also it's like this kind of grabbing on and letting go. If that makes sense, it's like you, you are not the boss, <laughs> you know, you, uh, you know, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make them drink that whole whatever that thing is. <laughs> so you yeah. try your best to just kind of like, well, this uh, um, set the scene and, 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 and put things in place that l lead to what you want, but ultimately you have to let it be what it's going to be. And that pretty much comes with just like listening and trying to understand what the director is trying to say and what they want to portray and, and, and and let's say you read something and you see it one way and then you talk to the director and it's oh, totally different. Okay, okay, totally different. Um, tell me more about that. Tell me why this is important to you. What is it about this particular scene and this particular motion? What is it that you wanna draw out of that? And then you can say, okay, well, I saw it like this because how it's written, it kind of felt like um, she was angry at him or whatever. Or, yeah, she's angry at him, that's true, but, I really want to see his point of view. You know, like those are the conversations that you have um, that kind of are drawing out and bringing out what what ultimately is going to like drive the image and stuff like that. And just like remembering that you are uh, uh, one of these, all, all these so many talks that have been online. Gabriel Bernstein was like, you are the translator of the, visual language like you are the one that understands the yeah. visual language and you bring and it, and you see that all the time it's like I work with a lot of first-time directors so for a lot of them this is the first time they're seeing their like thoughts reflected on this monitor how do you prepare for that like how do you prepare that conversation for them because you're almost like teaching them a language and also trying yeah. to teach them how to use that language while also letting them take credit for it in a way like that's yes a <laughs> well, because it's not about me and it doesn't putting yourself away, taking yourself out of the equation and being just like, well, this is what I see that the story is going. Okay, if we want to tell it from her point of view, then um, uh, uh, is she is she a kid? Is she angry? Is she like big? Is she small? Like those kind of things. Um, what is this? Do you have any references that are thinking that you had in mind when you were writing this? Let's talk about uh, what you were thinking and what you were feeling and draw from your experience and your um, influences and inspiration and all that do stuff. Do you personally share a lot of visual references with directors? Yes, yes, for sure. Because um, I think, you know, we talk with images, so using images as references is totally, like, above board and totally normal. Definitely have been trying to not just reference movies, but also, like, other things, you know, paintings, photos, whatever. Um, Photography obviously is always really good. Um, and in my quarantine time, I have been starting to like actually, I okay, I have started and I should get back to it, but you know, putting together all of references that I've had from other movies and just in general and trying to separate them into like a little bit of genre, a little bit of director, a little bit of like whatever. So I have been slowly at least uh, accumulating them from past project folders and putting them all together and kind of seeing the, um, similarities and differences and stuff like that like and you see oh you know I go to I go to Chivo a lot <laughs> I go back to this person a lot and I do the and I reference Roger Deakins a lot like everybody does you know like what is it that I have been uh, uh, referencing very often and 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 what are what what are different things and oh I forgot that I had referenced that movie for this thing yeah I didn't I didn't um, want to like officially plug this because I don't 
I don't want to give this guy all the credit, but uh, the DP Larry Shear or Lawrence Shear, who did uh, the Joker uh, mm -hmm. and a lot of other like Todd Phillips movies, like He's all doing great Hangover yeah. movies. <laughs> like he did all the Hangovers and then the Joker. But the yeah. reason why I bring him up is that he, when he was talking about the Joker and his aesthetic and his style, he mentioned this app that I'm not sure if he personally helped form it or it's just like a big proponent of it. But it's called Shop Deck. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. And I just think it's it's really exciting to see how more and more people are finding ways to express that visual language because yeah. it isn't just films, but it's still just like how the the colors and the composition mm -hmm. really like affect people on a visceral level. Uh, yeah. And actually that brings me to I wanted to ask, as a as a cinematographer, do you feel that you have a specific visual style or visual aesthetic? Yes. And I think just by the nature of you being the one making the choices, like that's like almost inevitable if you keep making mm. choices in a way that you're kind of like um, uh, confident and in charge of it, that does build. But at the same time, I don't want to be like pigeon held to a genre or anything like that. I've done comedy, I've done all, all these things. I want to do all, all the genres. Um, and I want to be flexible in all those things. And I want to change. Like, I, I definitely love, I've been using, like, a lot more hard light lately. And, you know, like, you know, everything was supposed to be a book light. And I'm like, okay, what if it isn't always a book light? <laughs> and what, and what you know, because when you discover book light and you're so excited because you're like, this is the most beautiful light. I'm never going to go. <laughs> but then it's like, okay, let's see what else we can do. And, um. I think definitely uh, you you do tend to like the light that you liked on the last one. You try to bring it into the next one, but um, but it is always about what does the story tell you? And what does the story feel like? And is it going to be low key? Is it going to be high key? Are they going to be by windows? Are they going to be? Is it going to be nighttime, daytime? You know, all these things kind of affect what you do. I don't know. I think someone else would have to look at my work and tell me if there's a style like I couldn't. I couldn't like pinpoint it myself. I don't yeah. think. Have you I'm worked not. with any, uh, sorry to interrupt you there, but yeah. um, have you worked with certain gaffers or key grips on multiple yeah. projects? And then it also helps you kind of, dare I say, like sustain a style? Yeah, for sure. I think, um, yeah, I definitely love working with gaffers and, and, and I love seeing what they bring to the table and, and always work with people that know more than you because it's so much fun. <laughs> And it's so much better and uh definitely do try to do that and uh, shout out to all the gaffers that I've worked with that have been amazing um and and but even then like I, I've worked in all a lot of different places that I can't bring I'm not a, at a position where I can bring my gaffer with me all the time so I have to work with different gaffers wherever I go but um but I think there's still a through line within all my work it's not it's not it's not wholly different one from the other um well, and hey, for for people yeah. that aren't familiar with you do you want to maybe uh explain <laughs> a little bit more about some of your international camera work uh, i worked in south africa Ooh, it was so cool it was a little movie and it was amazing and i had a great crew and um had a great gaffer on that one so yeah i've worked in uh last year i was in south africa i shot a movie in buffalo and then I shot a movie in Boston. So obviously, very disparate, di di different crews, very, very different situations, very different stories. Um, very, all, all low budget. So they all have that in common. I think that's, sure, that's my style. It's low budget. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I feel like that's one of those questions that I kind of hate to ask, but I know it's a big part of our industry is like, how does budget inform your creative choices? But yeah. and there's like this always there's always this catch twenty two of where you are in your career and what circles you run and what mm -hmm. budgets are afforded you or offered to you, you know? Yeah. Definitely not the biggest budgets yet. Yeah. Um but I I think it's never enough money. I've worked on big enough shows to know that you never have enough money. That's I'm sure some um 
person that knows about money, economist then can tell it has some sort of theory that is just ex exponential on how what you want just never reaches what you have. I'm sure there's like a theory on that somewhere. Um, so I've seen that it's never enough money, M more money, more problems. So it's always going to be about working with what you have and making the best of what you have for sure. So that's, what you do on the liberal scale and and you and this is a conversation that i've had lately a lot and just that i think is really important because something that has been always kind of falling through the cracks is prep and people that make movies especially people that are new can't afford or don't understand the importance mm -hmm. of giving time and you're a union person you know how prep has been just hacked and hacked and hacked and hacked but now we can't it's like a life or death situation whether we have prep or not and we really have to sit and think about how we're going into a project and i think it's like a really important conversation to have and what these huge real world limitations are and how to use them to still make art and to still make products and to still make things and and but but really thinking about how we are going to be influenced by the circumstances and by the thing is all, all the stuff going on right now i think it should inform you i think it should be part of what is it that we're making and why we're making it and how we're making it and what we're asking of people that are making it for us you yeah know, I have all to say, <laughs> that's always the, the the curious thing and again for i imagine people that are watching this maybe are in the business but maybe a lot of people aren't and I think it's important to kind of acknowledge how yeah. sometimes when there's all this work and you're going from project to project to project to project, um, you somehow have to, to fit in there your own rest, your own inspiration, your own mm -hmm. prep for the next thing. And sometimes life doesn't afford you that time, doesn't give you enough yeah. time to really get your sleep or to really get kind of re-excited again about joining mm -hmm. a new team or really giving something the adequate time to prepare for it, you know? Yeah. and. I'm just curious, maybe if you can explain more about your process kind of before COVID of how you would handle some things, some projects, maybe especially as a DP going mm -hmm. like between things and maybe then how you're handling yeah. it now. Yeah. Having done like a lot of smaller projects, is it does get taxing. And I did, I did realize, and I was actually in a point where I had to kind of like sit and reset and kind of like, kind of recalibrate myself because I was like piling things on too heavily and um and maybe starting to go through the motions and making things a little bit like automatic which isn't great um but yeah definitely you have to love everything a part of the process and really really enjoying that process of prepping and talking and re and, and discussing every aspect that you can about what the image is what it entails what do we need um that's always just a super important so just like reading the script over and over and over again and and asking as many questions as possible and and really being on a level with the director that um you are you know you have a second hand and you have a real tight communication is really important and you know it's again going back to the community a lot of the directors that i work with are my friends now and they're the zoom my zoom buddies and we're just like and it, it, it has you know reached outside of just that project or something like that so 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 that's cool and 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 that just is so much more helpful when we're going to go back into projects afterwards and we'll be that much closer and that much more in tune of what what how to work together which is really amazing and i'm not saying that you're going to be friends with everybody you work with <laughs> but trying to have some sort of human level and human connection with them is really important and and that informs so much of what how you work and, and what you do and and mutual respect and all that stuff is really really important to so yeah mm -hmm. just m making friends and and just really trying to get to know the people that you're with is 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 very beneficial to the actual just storytelling process mm -hmm. Would, would you say there are certain collaborators you've had, whether they're other camera people or directors or even producers that have really maybe shaped your career or really helped on the trajectory by continuing to work with them? Yes. Um, yeah, 
for sure. I, I think most of my inspiration come from the people right around me. Um, I know you interviewed Nona, me, Nona, and Lisa, Lisa Gipsova and Nona Catusano. I made a 35 millimeter project together last year, and that has been my um, light at the end of the tunnel. It's been like so amazing to have that project to work on and to just have a reason to talk to them every couple days. And and they are not that I needed a reason. They we talk all the time anyway. But just to have this project to work on together has just been so amazing. And it, it was collaborative from the get go, and it continues to be just this source of just seeing how their minds work and how their processes and working with two other dps is amazing <laughs> and and making something together with them is amazing so yeah they are definitely a main source of inspiration but that also goes for like the directors in my life serena juan is like one of my closest friends and she's someone who i'm like i'm stressing out today it's a bad day and i can just call her and and feel better so just yeah it's yes everybody around me is some sort of inspiration this is inspiring what you're doing and just kind of collecting these stories is really really cool and um i think thinking about what i've done in the past is definitely helpful to again kind of like recalibrate yourself to kind of like recenter yourself is really good so very grateful for you and you're such a hard worker and you've done so much with your career i can't even afford you anymore so <laughs> <laughs> Well, this so is a free, busy. free online Zoom. <laughs> I know, but when we go back, I'm like, I still, she's, she's too out of my, uh, too, too big for me. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. I mean, if anything, I, I think that's really what continues to inspire me as well, is that, yeah. you know, I, I think some people think of work or they think of the work they do as this like uh, plug in, plug out, a check in, check out. And this is for yeah. a paycheck. I'm, I'm doing this to pay my bills. And and those are really yeah. like real life concerns to have. Um, mm -hmm. But I think when you do have time to reflect on how you even got there, what keeps you there, you know, we, I don't think people think lightly about spending 17 hours on set with someone that's not their family or friends. So yeah. then you kind of have to really consider to yourself, like, do those coworkers that I'm spending 17 hours on set with, are they now my family too or not? You yeah. know, like, or not. yeah. Yeah, and there's something yourself. to be said, like work can be work. Not everybody's work has to be their life. Um, you, what is it you're supposed to work to live, not live to work? So, so having some sort of balance in life is important. But if, again, that just like speaks to how lucky we are that it is part of this just kind of, it is, it, it folds really well into just having a, a well-rounded life that you you're in a place where you're just happy to be creating and happy to be doing what you're doing. Um, even a bad day on set is a good day. And we've all been there when it's raining and it's in the middle of the night and it's cold and it's long days. And But then you get home and you're tired and it's like the best kind of tired. And <laughs> yeah. No, I can still remember the very, one of the very first days as even a PA on set. And it was just like such a long day. And remember coming home and being so exhausted and being like, I was of use and I was a part of something all day. And now yeah. I can go to bed and like yeah. that feeling like that sustained feeling of community and purpose and, and, uh, focus, uh, it's focus. Really, yeah. Mm -hmm. Kind of addicting to a certain extent. Um, yeah. That but flow in that, state that everybody likes that flow, that flow. Yeah. yeah. Well, which is again, like, again, the impetus to starting this series is that sense of, you know, how are all these creative people all across the globe handling, like, nothing, like handling mm -hmm. not working, not making, not being a part of something. Yeah. And so checking in with people as well as kind of telling their stories and also being really honest about what we think uh, it'll look like when we can go back. Yeah. So yeah. I don't know. I mean, I know that you... Um, you and I both are involved in our union in different capacities, but I was wondering if maybe you can speak a little bit to what what you think or how you how you feel sets are going to look like post COVID. Um, I mean, it's, it's not even post. I feel like it's like during COVID. You know, it's not like yeah. one day. I mean, sure, there's like this percentage that it can just go away, like like SARS or something. But uh, yeah. I think there's a more real possibility that it's something that we're going to continue to live with. And then we're going to yeah. continue making a product. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, my pie in the sky, like, dream scenario is that, you know, the big studio say, well, you know, we can't make Marvel for the next five years, so we'll invest in 200 smaller mid-level <laughs> movies that we can have, like, full control over and be super safe about and then hire 20-fold amount of people. That would be cool. <laughs> the grassroots. <laughs> That would be so That'd cool. Be cool. And then, like, all these people that will get to tell their stories that maybe not have had the chance before. That's like, that's a, that's you, utopian, idealist idea that I have. But I was like, oh, that would be nice. Remember mid level movies, like those mid range 5 million to 15 that so many people made their careers off of in like the 90s and 2000s. And, those are gone and 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 bringing those back in a way that okay well we can't control 500 to 800 people on set but we can control 100 people or 80 people on set and and have more uh precautions for that type of thing i don't know that'd be that'd be awesome but you know i i'm not a studio head i don't know what they're thinking i don't know what uh their their real plans are all i've heard is it's just it's just so weird to be sitting here and just waiting for like the industry to figure it all out and and you just feel kind of really helpless that you just can't do anything um yeah yeah i don't know i don't know i don't know i mean i miss being on set but i don't want to go back until it's some something like concrete and and yeah so you have to say that's a really wild part of this mm -hmm. experience i mean there's a lot of surreal parts of this experience to be sure but i have to say the those like human rights concerns that mm -hmm. as creative individuals or just any laborer has always had to deal with with just making sure you had enough water during the day or having access to a clean bathroom making sure you mm -hmm. get home safe and you're not too tired to get behind the wheel of your car like those yeah. are general human things that you hope that people Mm -hmm. consider for you and maybe they haven't been the highest concerns for producers or certain productions but yeah potentially now with covid and all the precautions that they would have to take you know i know people have been mentioning a lot about the hours on set you know and yeah. it's not necessarily we're going to work more hours because of this we might work less so then people mm -hmm. can maintain a healthy immune system and can maintain uh, their position in their department so they can also continue to provide for their families and for themselves. It's a really like exactly. curious ecosystem. But mm -hmm. I have to say that is like kind of, if anything, that's what I'm trying to tell myself is the, like the silver lining of how we hope that um, our concerns as humans and as, as people in a creative community, we can somehow, <laughs> somehow <improve> them. <laughs> yeah. Better at those things. Yeah. And I and like I get the need to produce and to make stuff. Like that's why we're here because we want to produce and make stuff. But all it is is just asking yourself, like, what are we making? Why are we making it? Who's telling the story? And um and what is needed to be to tell that story? That's like all it is. I think I I don't know. I don't know what the answer is, but I think it's it's just asking you yourself those questions before you like go into anything. And, and again, that is, that's really exciting to think about that maybe in this time, consumers and anyone watching YouTube or HBO or Amazon or Netflix, being more mindful of what stories you're watching and who's telling mm -hmm. those stories. And um, it's hard to not be aware of the demonstrations that are happening across the world right now mm -hmm. and to think about like who are the people providing those images? Who's sharing that story and what bias are they telling that story from? And like, mm -hmm. are you conscious of those things when they're not live? You yeah. know, like, are you conscious of who made that, that series that you've been binge watching or who was, mm -hmm. who's really benefiting from that, you know, beyond the fact that all the people that make those shows are all sitting at home right now. You know, there's all yeah. these different sides. Um, mm -hmm. But it is, I have to say, it's been really fascinating to think about like whose stories are we listening to? You yeah. Know, and how much mm -hmm. we are also as participants of it, people in the industry, how also like, I don't want to say complacent, but like compliant we are, complicit 
to yeah. sometimes just wanting to turn our head off and watch something shitty, you know, or like, I don't want to think too hard about this. Even when I want people yeah. to think too hard about this, you know, it's like yeah. the balance yeah. of it all. Yeah. Agreed. And yeah. And kind of another side of that is like when you're trying to make rent, but still want to like work in an industry that you work in, at, like some at some point something's got to give either, either you just take the job to take the job because you need the job and you can't really think about any further implications because you're like more like desperation causes people to not be able to hold on to things that they in other times may have said no to and you know like that's a concern is like everybody's going to be so hungry to take jobs now and so eager to that that it's a prime time for people to you know take advantage of that and be like well you're going to do this for cheaper or you're going to do this unsafely or you're going to do this you know and you you just feel like you have no other option so it is it's a big responsibility as a people in that place to that are able to to hire people and create people create content to think about again what are you asking well, who are you asking and what is it for? I think it's just really important because I've already seen it. I already see, I've already heard of people taking jobs that they're like, well, you know, they're a small production company and I know that they're going to, I don't want to, I don't want them to think I'm going to say no. <laughs> yeah. And th I think that's a, and, and you hear that a lot. And I did that too. I, I, I left the union world to say yes to smaller jobs in order to like build up my, career and I understand that that's something that you have to do when you're starting out is you say yes to everything but but that but we there's such a power in no and and you really have to be careful of what you're saying yes to especially now I think there's going to be a lot of people taking advantage of that eagerness that we all have to stand together and say no this isn't safe no this isn't worth it no we want to hear other stories yes we want to do this, but in a, in a, in a responsible way and on all facets of, of responsibility. <laughs> yeah. You know? Yeah. You know. Well, I want to say it's thank hard. you so much for your time, Kat. Um, there's so much work we have to do so much more stuff we have to do, but I appreciate you yeah. just sitting down and kind of hashing it out with me. Uh, and if there's anything else you'd like to say to the world or to the viewers, yeah. I don't know. It was very rambly of me. I'm sorry. And it feels, but it's, I don't know. Everybody has a lot of emotions and things right now. And I don't know. Got to get it out. And thanks for having us because it was a good place to talk. And yeah, really good points. So it was good. Thanks. Thank you. I'll see you around. <laughs> All right.